Right, what I want to talk about today is, do things touch? Do atoms touch? Do molecules touch? When I bring my hands together, are they actually touching or are they repelling? There's um, quite a lot on the internet and in the physics forums and the chemistry forums and in Reddit and a range of other fora about this question. So it's pretty close to my heart because what arrived in my inbox yesterday, my mailbox, was this. So this is my field of research, non-contact atomic force microscopy. The thing that puzzles me is if things never really contact each other, why do we draw a distinction between non-contact and contact atomic force microscopy? What is that distinction? So there is a such thing as contact atomic force microscopy? There is indeed. There's contact mode and there's non-contact mode. And I tell the first year students about this a lot. And they, actually a number of them have referred to this um, discussion on the internet. So we will actually, you know, particularly in the first couple of weeks when they come in. Just, you are aware you're holding a cup of tea. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, just let me t take one more slug of it and I'll put it over here, stupid. It's even closer to my heart because at the moment, um, I've been working on this paper well over the last couple of weeks, where we do what we called, and others before us have called, point contact probe microscopy. Notice the word contact. We go back to 1986, the inventors of the scanning tunneling microscope and the atomic force microscope. So these are two tools that allow us to see in not only individual atoms, but the state of the art is to see individual bonds, and I've waffled at length about these in previous videos. Just because you use the word doesn't automatically mean it's happening. The important thing is we can have a very rigid definition of what contact means. And the problem is with the discussions, some of the discussions on the internet, the, the argument seems to be, here's one atom, well, let's call it a molecule. Here's one molecule, here's another molecule. The problem with a lot of the discussions is that, well, you bring these molecules together, you bring them together, and then they start to repel. That's wrong. That's, that's, that's fundamentally wrong. That's not what happens. You bring two molecules together, even if they don't form a chemical bond, they attract. It's something called the van der Waals force, and where it originates from is that you've got electrons over here, you've got electrons over here. Quantum mechanics tells us that we don't pin those electrons down to a particular location. So they're fluctuating here and they're fluctuating here. That means that on, on very small fractions of time, you're getting dipoles, you're getting a charge, a slight charge imbalance. And that slight charge imbalance over here and that slight charge imbalance over here gives rise to an attractive force. And that's really important. Be long before you get to the repulsive side, you have an attractive force. Where we can define contact very easily is at the point where that attractive force is balanced by the repulsive force. And those discussions on the internet are quite correct. There is a repulsive force. And it's ultimately due to something called the Pauli exclusion principle, which basically, well, let's not go into the whole details of the Pauli exclusion principle. Lots of videos and 60 symbols about that. We have a very well-defined position at which the net force, the balance of the repulsive and the attractive contributions, is zero. And that actually defines the bond length, or defines the intermolecular separation if we don't have a chemical bond. But we do not need a sharing of electrons. We do not need an exchange of an electrons. This van der Waals force, which is everywhere around us, the typical example is how does the gecko st stick everywhere, and it's due to the van, ultimately due to this van der Waals force. So let me point out two things. Get yeah. those balls where you had them. Yep. Let me point out two things you've just done there. First of all, you've made a big point of this is the definition of contact. So you're saying this is just a definition. No, but it's, it's what we need to know is what do we do in science all the time? We try to have rigid definitions. We try to have rigid um, criteria. You know, when we think about simple laws like F is equal to MA, okay. etc. I'm willing to accept that's, uh, I'm even willing to accept that's a scientific definition of contact. Even when you were doing that analogy for me, you kept the balls apart. You didn't make the balls touch each other. But the important thing, yeah, but the, the, the issue here is what we mean by contact. Okay, so... Right? So what this, do you... Is you, science or is this... Are we just talking about words and definitions here? I guess, you know, those two things are always in, in, intrinsically entangled. You know, definitions and what we mean and what analogies we use and what models we use. How accurate are they? My concern is this idea of... Which is demonstrably wrong demonstrate because we do this measurement in the lab on a daily basis. We take one molecule up here, we bring it to another and we measure that force directly. And we can see where that force turns around and where that force goes to zero due to this balance of the attractive impulse. Once you reach this point that you tell me is contact, yeah. can they move any closer? 
If they move closer, they get a repulsive force in the opposite direction. That's the key thing. If they move closer, they start to experience a repulsive force. And if they never came into contact, we can measure this directly. This Hang on! We can measure this directly in the experiment. We can bring this one molecule in and we can crush this one. How, how do you get atomic positions which are changing if you're crushing one molecule? The simple fact that you say, once you reach the contact point, if we move them even closer, they start repelling. The simple fact that they can even be moved closer but how do we says to me that they weren't in contact. No, but how do we define contact in this case, on the macroscopic world? Right? How do we, we bring this in, we bring it there, right? So I can push down on it, but if at the point of contact, Right, if we try, if, oh, I really need a... Phil, I don't think anyone is arguing about the definition of contact the, on the macroscopic level. Everyone right, okay, well that's fine. Is. Okay, right, so on the microscopic level, the thing that I find concerning is the idea that it's only electron repulsion. Attraction is not mentioned, even when you've got what are called physical interactions, so not chemical interactions, this type of interaction. Put my hand... As Right at the atomic and the molecular level, there is an attractive force there before that repulsive force could, comes in. And it's the balance of those two forces. So exactly. So, you know, you've got something falling under gravity, right? Okay, so we've got a reaction force from the floor. You know, how do you define contact in this case? It's, we're basically just scaling down that type of idea down to the atomic level. Because why else would we have another definition? Let me tell you how, how I feel about what you've just said. At the very start, you used the analogy of clapping hands. And you said, some people say these two hands have not come into contact. You said, that's not true, let me tell you why. You then showed me this stuff about van der Waals force, you showed me this, this magic point where the two forces reach an equilibrium. And do you know what I took from that? My hands don't touch when I clap, but they get to this point where these forces but what, balance okay. out and they never quite get right, well, let's, no. because the repulsive well, force then finally let's got its way. Well then let's define what you mean by touching. Do you mean that the nuclear cores come together? Do you mean that the nuclei come? Because if so, that's, you know, there is really no point in discussion because oof, th those energy scales are completely out of reach. We're not going to have, if we could have nuclear, geez, if we could have nuclear fusion by doing that, wonderful. It's about a question of how do you define that contact point, and my point is that that point in science is pretty well defined. Well, what are the fundamental quantities in physics? Energy, mass, force, etc. And so if we're talking about force, so let's make a definition on the balance of forces. So you're, making, how much the, more you're natural? making the definition of contact the point where these two forces balance out and we can't move the atom closer. Yeah. No, no, I didn't say we can't move the atom closer. Okay, well then if we can move the atom closer, I argue they're not in contact. Because that we could move them closer. Right, so let's go back to this. Let's go back to this. Are they in contact? Hang on, are, we, are you talking about them as footballs or atoms? As footballs. Are they in contact? Yes. All right, if I do that and I squeeze down on that one. Right, so that's exactly what's happening. When you push these in, you get a repulsive force. But the important thing is where do you... You have to... It's not like we have a switch on, it's not like the forces switch on and switch off instantaneously over very, very small ranges. They, they vary smoothly. I must admit that's one definition. You can have other definitions of the contact point. Yeah. Right? So if it's a chemical bond, for example, you could say, right, at the point at which the overlap of the electron density is such and such, we'll define that as well. The important thing is that the physics is such, we can dress it up in whatever mathematical language you like, but the physics is such that at the atomic level, we have contact because otherwise, why would I, why would we call these techniques okay. non-contact and contact? Here's what, here's what I think. Here's a scientific definition of what I think a normal person would think of as contact between two particles. I think, and what all these <laughs> normal person. what all these analogies are trying to get at, I think true contact between two particles, say two electrons, is the point at which the space occupied by the electron could have no Planck lengths between it and the space occupied by another electron. 
but that, but a point where you could no longer fit, like the point of the electron has zero Planck lengths between the, the electron to the right. But that fundamentally in quantum mechanics, you can never have that. But that's that's yeah, an extreme. So, yeah, so but that's an extreme definition. Where would you use that definition? That's like saying you're going to define contact as when I overlap this football with the other one and they occupy the same space. That's exactly what no, you're saying. Well, when you touched them, they got to a point where I could no longer put a piece of paper between them, and so they were in contact for like uh, on the map. But you're arguing that if two, two electrons occupy the same space, not the same space. There's just no longer. Well, the prob yeah, but them. the problem is, you know, from you've done these videos over the years, we cannot define an electron like a particle like that. Yeah, so and I think that's why things can't come. Yeah, so therefore the analogy. My point again is the analogy breaks down, and you've got to come up. You've got to use a scientific definition that everybody can agree with. I agree. It has clear delineation points, which is very helpful for a definition. And if that's the definition you want, that's fine. But I think your definition of contact, your scientific definition of contact, the point where force X and force mm -hmm. Y come into balance, isn't what the normal person But the problem is touching. you can't extend what the normal person thinks about touching down to the quantum level. So you have to come up with another definition. Your analogy breaks down. Analogy yeah. entirely breaks down. Yeah. Because you cannot extend it down to the quantum level. So when people make these videos or have these discussions that upset you, where they say things don't contact, what I think they're doing is these people have realised the wonder of what's going on at this microscopic... But they have to get the level. physics on, right. Let me finish. Okay, sorry, sorry. They've realised the wonder of what's happening at this nano level. And a really good way to convey the wonder of that is to say, do you know what? These things aren't even touching. I agree. I agree. But you have to be careful to the extent to which you overplay that and you hype it. This is the important thing. And it's, the tr it's true not just in terms of public engagement, in terms of, of YouTube videos and education via, via online uh, channels, etc. It's true also in terms of the science we do. It's very easy for us to overhype our results and, and, and give them a connection to the real world that might not be justified. You've got to be very careful when you put analogies across to explain what the deficiencies might be in those analogies. All right.